Hey everyone, I'm Mr. Terry, high school history teacher. Welcome back to another History Teacher Reacts video. All right, a video came through my feed that I thought was gonna be really interesting to check out. And it's also from a channel I have not reacted to before. And the channel is Kyle Hill. All right, now I, I think I've been sleeping on uh, Kyle because he has 1.375 million subscribers. And this video that we're gonna be checking out is titled, The Time We Nuked Five Men to Prove a Point. All right, and this video has over 3 million views in just over two, three months. All right, the original video link is gonna be down below. Make sure that you support Kyle and the video there. With that, I don't know if this is gonna protect me from a nuke, but let's get started. Los Alamos. On July 19th, 1957, five well, later U.S. Air Force officers and one photographer volunteered to stand a few miles behind me. Next to them, a sign that said Ground Zero, Population 5. Yo, Thor? Is Kyle Thor? Have we ever seen them in the same room together? Is Thor making sweet videos? In the next few minutes, a two kiloton nuclear warhead would detonate 18 and a half thousand feet directly above their heads. Why would these men volunteer for such a demonstration? I oh, know. And what happened? Science. Great example, great intro there. So 1957, we are moving into the height of the Cold War and Cold War hysteria. Uh, by this time, the Soviet Union is developing incredibly powerful bombs um, that are competing with the United States here after World War II for atomic supremacy. So the amount of nukes that were detonated here in the 50s was insane. And the test just kept getting bigger and bigger. And there was a lot of danger involved. And then, let's see. How, uh, yeah, I want to know a story about these five guys. They just kind of here for scientific purposes. Are they just being patriotic here? Or do they have a suicide wish? I don't know. Let's find out. Let's see what you got, Kyle. You got me hooked. This is the 14th video in the series Half-Life Histories. So is it all like atomic? Before they were banned stuff? internationally in 1963, most above-ground nuclear weapons tests were as much spectacles of nuclear supremacy as they were actual tests. Mushroom clouds kilometers high, X-ray driven fireballs hotter than the sun, light intense enough to vaporize a vehicle's paint job. But in this incredible archival video of five men willingly <laughs> standing underneath a nuclear explosion, no glass. we see something else. Instead of destruction, not much more than a synchronized flinch. A few moments earlier. Okay, this is cool footage. I've never heard of this. I've never heard of this. I always wondered if there had been casualties and things like that from nuclear testing that maybe the US government has not put out before. Um, and same with the Soviet Union side of things there. So here in the 50, 57, by the way, because they're talking about atomic uh, testing in the air, um, later towards the about mid 60s, um, both sides had agreed to stop doing atmospheric testing because they understood the horrible effects that something like this could have on the environment. So um, you couldn't do testing in the air uh, or space, if you could figure that out, um, or underwater. It had to be underground. 65 miles northwest of Las Vegas, an F-89 interceptor had launched a two kiloton nuclear warhead directly above the heads of Colonel Sidney Bruce Lieutenant Colonel Frank Ball, Major Norman Bottinger, Major John Hughes, Don Luttrell, and George Yoshitaki, the unseen cameraman. Okay. These men were ground zero, population five, for a successful test of the world's first air-to-air -air nuclear weapon. These men volunteered to get nuked to prove a point. To you. What? It's safe? <laughs> In Does it actually kill people? In the struggle between two great powers to shape the post-war world. In the middle years of the Cold War, but before intercontinental ballistic missiles would render them tactically disadvantageous, right. Cold War America was most worried about a surprise nuclear attack from fleets of Soviet bombers. Right. Yeah, because the they're saying internet, inter intercontinental ballistic missiles, ACBMs, that's where you can put a nuke on a rocket and then deliver it from different parts of the world, which would, you know, be safer than uh, having to send a plane out and try to, you know, fly into enemy territory and then drop it. And especially as the bombs were getting bigger and bigger, 
with larger yields, you know, plane crews uh, are going to be even more danger, right? So anyway, it's like we're still talking about an era where we're pre-missiles. Anti-aircraft technology at the time wasn't equipped to handle dozens of relatively high-flying, fast-moving planes. So in the August of 1954, President Dwight D. Eisenhower appointed MIT President James R. Killian Jr. to lead some of the nation's top scientists, engineers, and industry professionals in an effort to counter this potential threat, to develop strategy and technology that would make this aspect of the Cold War a little colder. All right. 370 like be able to take out later, a panel of 42 planes? experts produced a 190-page document entitled Meeting the Threat of Surprise Attack. During their four-hour testimony to the U.S. National Security Council in 1955, the experts argued that the most effective way to meet a thermonuclear-equipped adversary in the air was with nuclear weapons also in the air. Indeed, the report recommended that nuclear weapons should be the main defense against possible air attacks. That sounds crazy. First off, how would you take out a nuke with a nuke if you're not able to, if it's pre-rocket telemetry? But then also, wouldn't the nuke also detonate you end up destroying yourselves and your own land and people let's hope they got an answer for the that. reasoning was simple a single warhead of significant tonnage should be enough to wipe out an entire fleet of soviet aircraft flying in bomb yeah. formation sure. the council was convinced that same year but but would you only do that in if you can somehow pick it up from a safe territory or okay, so I th I think what they're trying to do is if you if you blow the nuke up when it's at when the when the enemy plane is at a high point, right? And you use your nuke at a high level, it'll be too high for the the radiation um, to invoke in, in, invoke much much damage, even if it's in your own home territory. That that's what I'm thinking. They're development at, would see. begin on the McDonnell Douglas Air Two A Genie a 1.5 kiloton nuclear warhead that could be fired air to air. But there was still a problem. How would you? The public. Rightly sensing How that would Americans you do it, might still? not want nuclear bombs detonating above their heads even in defense, the Killian Committee also recommended that an upcoming demonstration of the Genie technology be promoted to citizens okay. as an advertisement of its safety. <laughs> a nuclear bomb okay. publicity stunt. I, I'm wondering how, how you how do you actually like launch it or whatever from air to air, right? If it's not going to be delivered like a rocket, you just fly by them and let it go. But then like your, your pilots are going to get annihilated. Two years later, July 19th, I'm talking 1957. F-89 pilot Captain Eric William Hutchinson fires a 1.5 kiloton nuclear warhead powered by a solid fuel Thiokol SR-49 TC-1 rocket engine. Okay, so we do have the engine rockets. Runs for air to air seconds. rockets. Now traveling Just at not over three times the speed of sound, the rocket flies for another 12 seconds. Hutchinson How would you executes get out of a dangerous high G maneuver to ensure that he escapes the 1,000 foot blast radius. Right. And then the genie was out of the bottle. The rocket is gone. We felt a heat pulse, a very bright light, a fireball. It is going to wear like sky looks glasses, sunglasses. It. it is boiling above us there. Wow. How is a nuclear weapon dangerous? <laughs> it may surprise you to Physics. learn that what most people imagine to be the most destructive aspect of a nuclear weapon the ionizing radiation and subsequent fallout is in reality the smallest fraction of a yeah. detonation's colossal energy output. And ionizing radiation only makes it so far in air as it... So I, I mean, when you look at like Hiroshima and Nagasaki, like they're able to recover and you can go there and stuff like that. And nuclear test sites, you can go to the Trinity test site in New Mexico where they blew up the first one and go like right there. You can, you can do that. So yeah, the radiation isn't as big of a deal. Now, if you're talking where radiation gets bad is something like like a meltdown at Chernobyl or something where it's going to be like, what, thousands of years or something before that 
uh, site can even be inhabited. It collides with the atmosphere's atoms and molecules, while fallout is of most concern when an explosion vaporizes a large amount of additional material, like terrestrial rock or sea coral. Therefore, a relatively small nuclear weapon, like the Genie's W-25, detonating at an altitude six times higher than the highest building on Earth, did in fact pose very little threat to anyone on the ground. Fireballs would rise into the sky. I had heard that that the, I don't know if it was Hiroshima and Nagasaki or whatever, but that it was detonated a lot higher than it, than it could have been. Um, which was ma made to make it maybe not as powerful as it was before, or I mean, as it could have been by again detonated so high rather than detonating a lower. Cool. Any minimal fallout would spread out as to become mostly harmless. A warhead carrying Soviet aircraft, on the other hand, would find it physically impossible to escape deletion, right. as a missile moving at Mach 3.3 instantly transforms into a 1,000 foot wide sphere of air hotter than the center of a star. The Crazy. same year that five men successfully stood beneath Shot John of Operation Plum Bob, like the, drone the United States started producing some 3,100 Genie air-to-air -air rockets and attached wow. them to interceptor aircraft at 31 bases across 20 states. And it was not long before, or not long after this, that technology became obsolete as far as you didn't need to anymore because ICBMs are going to be, you know, coming up. The Genie would remain in service for almost another 30 years. And secretly, the only nuclear weapon that could be launched in response to an attack without presidential authority. <laughs> Thankfully, really? the only Genie that Just was ever make fired it and detonated was at Ground Zero, Population 5. Let's see these boys. By the late 80s, nuclear strategy changed. It had to. Intercontinental ballistic missiles could now quickly strike nearly anywhere on Earth. But I guess there was 20 years one, before that, though. Like the Russians' R-36 warhead with a 25 megaton yield could glass an entire city and spread deadly fallout over half a coast. This this website, Nuke Map, look it up. I When we talk about Cold War, I like to show this to my students and we just play around with it a little bit to basically scare them it's a it's a it's a website here just just google nuke map where you can um it kind of synchronizes with with google maps where you can pick a bomb like a real bomb um that has you know been uh, prepared or detonated so you can do like the, the fat boy or um even go up to like the czar bomb but the biggest one ever and drop it somewhere and it'll give you like estimated casualties it's really kind of scary so I do that. I'll do that in my class and we'll like put it right on our like our town and and it freaks people out. Gone were the days of relatively slow fleets of bombers that could be stopped with unfocused nuclear fire. The age of mutually assured destruction was here. And we've been living atop the insane geopolitical knife edge that replaced the genie ever since. As for the five men at ground zero, they were right. Or at least what they were told before the they volunteered was right. Time and distance is what saved them, what made the test a suitable PR We stunt. did it, boys. We're not vaporized. Exploding outwards from a single point, the intensity of a nuclear bomb's pressure wave, ionizing radiation, and scalding heat decreases exponentially with the square of the distance traveled. A warhead like Genie's with a 1,000 foot blast radius wouldn't be three times less intense three radii away, it would be nine times less intense. And therefore, with over 18,000 feet between them and a Genie out of the bottle, the men would hear a shockingly large noise eventually, but feel little else. Mm. And by presumably not spending very much time in the area of any potential fallout, long-term health effects for the men were extremely unlikely. So they left immediately. Indeed, records show that because that would be that would be my my thing is did they leave immediately? Um, did the fallout have enough time to actually reach them? All right, looks like we're seeing what happened to these guys. Every single one of them lived very long lives afterwards. Some lived well into their nineties. Donald Luttrell passed away just eight years ago. It's not the kind of time you might expect afforded to you after standing directly below a nuclear blast.
Nukes are safe. Don't time worry, folks. And distance. We don't have to worry. Until anymore. next time. <laughs> Very cool. I'll right, give you my final thoughts. All right, Kyle did a great job here. This uh, was very interesting. I'd never heard of this story before. And this is kind of stuff that I find my students really get into. So this is definitely a, um, a story that I will want to pass on and, and share uh, because I get so many questions about that. And I still need to learn more about the effects of atomic weapons and what they can do. So <laughs> I don't know if I'd be like, all right, kids, you actually don't have to worry anymore. But again, it just, it, it did, I could see again why I guess they would test it because you, I mean, you heard me at the beginning of the video. I was like, this sounds absurd that you're going to take down a nuke with a nuke. But then when you look and, and see that it could actually happen and I guess be done safely, then it, yeah, it would reduce the, the anxiety that people had, which was again, such an incredible time in the fifties and in the sixties at the height of the cold war, Cuban missile crisis, all that kind of stuff. Um, so you had to ease the public, all that, because people were, uh, were frightened. They really were um, during this, this part of the Cold War. Anyway, this was great. Great story there. I love that there was uh, some great footage. Again, I'm definitely going to share it in my class. If there are other videos from this uh, site that you think would be applicable to us and our community and to what I do, um, let me know. You can uh, suggest down below, of course. Um, and you can also come over to the Discord server and drop over the a, uh, video suggestion um, over there. There's a channel for that. That's a good place to do that. Uh, but anyway, let me know what you think about just the role of nukes. I mean, one of the questions I ask my kids all the time is, is are, are nukes making the world safer? Or is it just a matter of time of, of you know, uh, cooler heads not prevailing and you know, nuclear, all out nuclear war, you know, happening. It's a scary thought, but it's an interesting debate that I always have there. So let me know what you think about the role of nuclear weapons in the world today down in the comments. All right, with that, we'll see you next time. Bye.